Hi, Nick here, co-convener and co-founder of Queer Disrupt. Today, I'll be passing over the reins as we are joined for a special podcast by Jack Shoulder, Myla Corviday and Robert Berg. In this episode, they'll be brushing off the cobwebs and swinging through history to get our senses tingling with some LGBTQ plus representation in comic books. So park your bum down and hang about for February's podcast. Hope all of you can spider man gold sentences in this intro because it took longer than I care to remember or admit and I got caught in some sticky structures on the way. After you've listened, spin on over to our events page on the web and spy the upcoming events we have. And if this hasn't already got you crawling up the walls, I'll stop now. <laughs> so please enjoy this month's podcast. Hi, welcome to another episode of the Queer Disrupt podcast. So today we have um, some new people. This is a very different voice to some of you. My name's Jack Shoulder. I work in museums and heritage and joining me today we have Myla. Tell everyone about you. Hi, uh, my name is Myla Corvide. Uh, my pronouns are they them. I work in a variety of fields including heritage, acting, artwork, illustration, writing, kind of a bit of everything really so that's me and I also love comics which is why I'm here. Fantastic and joining myself and Myla we have got Robert. Robert tell everyone about you. Hi I'm Robert Berg, pronouns are he him. I am a freelance writer which is usually a lot of boring business copy but I have a master's in theatre history and criticism and most of the fun stuff I do is online on Twitter talking about pop culture, lots of Muppets, and I love comics and sci-fi TV and all that stuff. <laughs> and in case you haven't guessed, I'm also a massive comic fan as well. And I just want to give a shout out to one of Robert's Twitter threads. A while ago, he did a massive one on a whole rewatch of Murder, She Wrote. So <laughs> if you're into older women solving crime, then find Robert on Twitter. It's literally um, thousands of tweets long. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before we get completely sidetracked into Angela Lansbury possibly doing a lot of murders, we are <laughs> going to be talking today about comic books and super and all of that really wonderful geeky stuff. We are here today to talk about LGBTQ representation, characters, writers in superhero comics. So we're going to be going all the way through from 1938, from the Golden Age of Comics, right up and to the modern day, which if you're listening from the far future, is 2020 when we're speaking. So things might change a lot because comics happen really, really quickly. So in the last few years, comic books have absolutely exploded in terms of popularity, thanks to um, the MCU really bringing superheroes to the forefront of the cultural imagination. Um, next time a, a massive movie drops, chance I'll be a Marvel film. But superheroes have been around for a very, very, very long time indeed. One might argue that they go all the way back to like mythology, because we have superpowered people doing all sorts of superpowered things. But the ones we're going to be talking about today really see their origins in the 1930s. So 1938 is known as the start, the golden age of comics. So this is where comics really, really begin. We see Superman being published for the first time. We see Batman being published for the first time. We see Wonder Woman being published for the first time. So the big three of comics happening right there. And they kind of toodle along a little bit doing their thing and solving crime in 30 pages or less, usually setting up the next issue as well. After the Golden Age of Comics, we get the Silver Age, which is from the mid-1950s around about the 1950s, and we see Marvel really coming to the fore. But before that, they existed, but they mostly did horror comics, and it was only with the publication of the Fantastic Four, but Marvel really started to get attention. After the Fantastic Four, we got the Avengers, we got the X-Men, we got Spider-Man, all happening in a very, very, very brief moment in time. So the Silver Age of Comics existed until about the 1970s. After the 1970s, we get the Bronze Age of Comics. So the 70s and the 80s are the Bronze Age of Comics, which kind of implies that the storytelling is getting less good. 
I don't agree with that personally. <laughs> I think this, the stories are getting more and more sophisticated. What we're seeing less of is new characters being introduced. But then we go from the mid 80s to the mid 90s, what's known as the dark age of comics. The 90s is an interesting point in time. Some people see it as like the nadir of the the, the comic industry. The storylines were not great. There were mutants involved all over the place. Instead of telling a decent story, it was just slap a different cover on it and let's just go for sales, 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 sales. But what we do see in the dark age of comics is more of a movement towards an adult audience. So the industry has really realized that grown-ups are reading these stories, not just kids. Speaking kind of for, for our generation here, the 90s is when we saw the comics really be adapted to TV for like the first time in a long time in a really, really major way. Yes, we had the really camp Adam West Batman in the 60s, but the 90s is where we saw the animated X-Men, animated Spider-Man. And those like mainstays of Saturday morning TV have really kind of stayed with us and really informed us like how we think of these characters. And then from the 90s into the noughties, we get present day, the modern age comic, which starts in the year 2000. Some comic academics say yes, there are comic academics. The fact that comic academics exist make me really, really happy. And <laughs> starting with they tend to place Ultimate Spider-Man issue number one as the start of the modern age comics. That was when Marvel had a little bit of a soft reboot because they realized that they've got 40 odd years of backstory. The movies were just about starting to take off and they were thinking, OK, how do we introduce new people to all of these comics? So they introduced alternate dimension, for want of a better word, another reality, reintroducing all of these characters. So that's a kind of pit stop through comics history from the 1930s to say we will be talking about characters instead of just timelines. But throughout that, we see hundreds, thousands of characters. And today we're going to be talking about LGBTQ characters. And from about the year 2000 to the modern day, actually in the last 10 years, we've really seen like an explosion of queer representation in comics. In 2020 and this year, Marvel made a big deal about about introducing new non-binary heroes, that didn't go down too well. So in March, before the world went a bit all over the place, and we are in the situation we're in, Marvel introduced two new characters. They were called Snowflake and Safe Space. And the press releases <laughs> they did at the time were phrased very kind of celebratory. Yes, we've done this thing. Isn't it cool? It only took three days for the backlash. <laughs> really, really make yourself apparent once these stories came out. And a lot of it was because they just didn't handle it in a really brilliant way. The names themselves were a joke. I mean, like, what, what do you guys feel about the names Safe Space and Snowflake as superior names? Do you think they work? <laughs> no, not really. No. It, yeah, I could in a comedy sketch or a very specific situation, but as an actual superhero name, it's really hard to tell what tone they're going for. Exactly. And tone is something they completely got wrong. For a start, despite giving them a press release and a big platform, they shunted them in a um in a title that just wasn't popular at all. And also Marvel kind of got their own history wrong. They were saying that these were the first non-binary characters um, that they've ever had. Not true. Back in the <laughs> 1980s, um, there was a character called Cloud, who we might describe as gender fluid, sometimes presented as male, sometimes presented as female. They've had shapeshifters for God knows how long. And Mystique has been around since um, 1978. So they may have been the first characters described in these ways, but they aren't necessarily the first time we've seen characters who would present in a way that we might describe as non-binary if we go back in time and if we look at other stuff that's going on, we can really start to pinpoint where we're seeing LGBTQ representation, where we're starting to see um, LGBTQ issues really, really explored. And we get a little bit of a sense as to why it took so long for these stories to really come to the fore. So before we get started in that, I just want to turn back time a little bit, indulge my inner share, turn back time and take us back to the 1940s in particular, I want us to have a think about Batman and Robin. So Batman and Robin, the dynamic duo, Robin was introduced as a, as a protege to 
to make him a little bit more appealing by adding in someone who the audience can really see themselves in. You know, young kid really wanting to be a superhero and learning how to be a superhero. Batman and Robin do their thing. They fight crime for a little bit. Looking back, there are some things that are a little bit interesting. So Batman and Robin spend quite a lot of time by themselves. They both have these big secret identities that they can't tell anyone about. So all of a sudden, there's some kind of coding in there that we might relate to as queer people reading these. But we also see them on what could really easily be described as dates, almost. There's really well-known panels of Batman and Robin enjoying a moonlight row in a boat. And because Bruce Wayne is fabulously wealthy, darling, we often see them in like really like exotic locations or in stars. And for some reason, all of this didn't sit well with one person in particular. And that person was Frederick Vartan, who in 1954 wrote a book called The Seduction of the Innocent. And it's published and it causes a little bit of a stir. So in this book, um, Frederick Burton was really concerned about the overt depictions of sex, violence and other adult fare within comic books. And one thing he really cites is the relationship between Batman and Robin. In particular, one really well-known panel where it looks like Batman and Robin are sharing a bed. In fact, it's, it's like a twin bed kind of setup. They're just very close together. Artist mm. doesn't have a great sense of perspective. And if you get a second, Google Batman, Robin, all sorts of things will come up. Make sure you safe search it on there. <laughs> <laughs> and this is kind of the panel that set off Frederick Burton going about pretty much demonizing comic books and saying, no, they're, they're not great for kids. It's the, the Helen Lovejoy gift. And so on, please think of the children. Mm. But in in a very, very different form. So this leads to a whole movement, and all of his assertions, it has to be said, are based largely on undocumented anecdotes. And a lot of it is, frankly, just in his own head. But because he causes this moral panic in the comic book industry at the time, which is largely DC comics. Indie comics hadn't quite taken off at this point. Marvel comics wasn't quite Marvel. They were still timely comics. They were still doing a lot of horror genre stuff. The occasional romance one in there as well. They were thinking, okay, how can we respond to this moral outrage that Burton is kicking off? And the response was to form something called the Comics Code Authority, also known as the CC. And if you've got any comic books lying around at home, you might notice a little CCA logo usually on the front cover. So they formed this Comics Code Authority mostly to avoid any government interference, so to stop any legislation saying, no, you can't publish this. It was a voluntary thing that uh, they would sign up to and be a part of and stamp on their comic books. But the interesting thing is that retailers started to see it as a kind of quality assurance code and advertisers saw it as a safe space. To be honest, we could spend a whole few hours just talking about the weird things that would be advertised in comic books. But I just want to go through a few things that are in the Comics Code Authority guidelines from the 1950s and think about how they might pertain to LGBTQ representation. So for a start, the CCA guidelines don't want to deal with anything in the horror genre. So vampires, ghouls, and in particular werewolfism is prohibited. I'm not sure why werewolfism is prohibited, but I think that's kind of interesting because quite often with those monsters, we see a lot of, of queer coding kind of happening, particularly thinking Dracula being a kind of pansexual force to be reckoned with and all sorts of associations between queerness and werewolves that kind of comes through in all sorts of other ways. So that's that one way that queer representation is kind of being almost erased or at least a chance for it to be erased. There's also one in particular that probably relates more closely than anything to the horror genre, and that is that sexual perversion or any inference to the same is strictly forbidden. So at this time, we're in the 1950s, sexual perversion would include 
things like LGBTQ representation. Thinking in terms of novels, at this point, there's already been some big LGBTQ novels being published, The Well of Loneliness, for example. But whenever those moments in publishing have happened, there's always been a big backlash with legal cases and stuff like that. So comic books, again, wouldn't be aimed at a literary crowd, but now there's even more stuff to stop them exploring these things, even when legislation starts to be more favourable to the LGBTQ community. But unfortunately, the legislation kind of takes a while to kick in. Think about when the LGBTQ rights movement first started to be in the states. I mean, we'll be talking quite a bit about legislation in the United States because comics tend to really come from the USA. It tends to kick off in the in the late 60s. So Stonewall riots are one of the most well-known LGBTQ pushbacks against the um, infringement of our civil liberties. And in the 1960s, we do start to see superheroes really kind of taking on social justice causes and not just heroes, but villains as well. Poison Ivy, for example, was introduced in the 1960s very much with a eco agenda, which she still has. And she popped up again in the in the 90s in the camp classic Batman and Robin film. And we might be talking about Poison Ivy later. So we can start to see these things kind of come through. In the 60s, we see the X-Men introduced as well. And they are a group of people who are born differently and they fight for, for justice for a world that hates and fears them. And if any bunch of superheroes is queer coded, it is the X-Men. The X-Men, I have to say, are my, my kind of go-to comic when I read them. They just hit all of those notes for me. So forgive me if this gets a little bit X-Men heavy. But in terms of LGBTQ legislation, um, it really, really starts to come in much, much later than the, than the 1960s. Is mostly in the later half of the actually from like 2011 onwards. So in the in the 80s and 90s, the AIDS epidemic had a catastrophic effect on the LGBTQ community all over the world, and that is picked up on in the comics. We're going to be going back to that. In 2011, there was legislation introduced so the um, military could serve openly in the US. So Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. In 2015, there was equal marriage in all 50 US states. And as recently as 2017, it became legal for same-sex couples to adopt children in all 50 states. So in the last few years, there's been this real kind of explosion in legislation that has meant that LGBTQ people do have equal rights and equal visibility and access to being able to create a, you know, create a family with um, and raise children, things like that. And when these big moments happened in the real world, we can see them being reflected in comic books as well. So recently, this year, we saw, for the first time, two queer superheroes getting married. We saw Hulkling and Wiccan, um, two Marvel superheroes, getting married. Robert, you are kind of our Hulkling Wiccan person. Can you tell us about that moment? Yeah, what was I found really incredible about it was they actually had two weddings. They first had a quiet one in Vegas, which was a very last minute thing that they just throw together. And then later they have the in space wedding, which is even more exciting because it was extremely Jewish. They're, even though they're in space, they, they break the glass. They have a rabbi who says he's never done an intergalactic, you know, same sex Jewish wedding before and happy is to finally do that. In fact, even when they step on the glass, there's actually a rainbow Krish noise that mm -hmm. they show on the screen with, uh, on the, um, the panel, which I loved. It was just, it felt like such a, um amazing climax to everything that had come before it. Because I, I had read all of the Wicked and Hulkling there was over the course of the last few months. I was, I've been obsessed with it. And it just felt, it felt like I was actually there. It was great. <laughs> and it really felt like a celebratory moment. And there was a whole host of superheroes at both receptions, really, the secret one and the real one. And the revelation that they that Wick and Hulkling had been married for the duration of this story arc actually had implications during the story arc. Can you can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, there's a lot of complicated space opera stuff that goes on, but Hulkling is basically the king of the universe, sort of. So he has some responsibilities that in order to be faithful to his people, he couldn't have any um, loyalty to Earth. 
So he basically had to act as if he did not have a partner. He had to publicly send Morgan away and say that he has no ties to Earth or to anyone who may impede the running of, of the uh, um, I don't know how much you want me to get into like Cree versus Skrull or anything, <laughs> but um, basically he's half Cree, half Skrull, which means he represents the joining of two races that have been fighting for Correct. centuries, millennia. Yeah. <laughs> so he had to publicly disassociate from Wiccan while st- in what seems like a very dramatic scene, you then go backwards and find out that before that had even happened, they'd already been secretly married in Vegas. It's a really nice moment of what are they doing how are you doing this and then a second later realizing that it's all it's all okay <laughs> which is my favorite favorite thing about Wicked and Hulkling usually ends up being all okay <laughs> they're like my my comfort queer a comic couple yeah and even though we're saying secret wedding it wasn't just them yeah. and no one there it was still close friends and family and um there's this brilliant line in oh it's it's last minute no one will be able to make it and they say actually no half of our friends are speedsters the other half are teleporters it's fine even though it's literally that night everyone (laughs) shows up because they're superheroes so they can exactly um so to put that in a little bit more perspective wiccan's twin brother is a speedster called speed who is also LGBTQ. And their uncle, because everyone's related in comics, their uncle is Quicksilver, who, again, is a speedster. You might recognize him from some of the more recent X-Men films, also Avengers Age of Ultron. And for some weird, complicated reason that, again, we could spend the next three hours discussing, their mum is Wanda, the Scarlet Witch, in a very, very roundabout way. Yes, she is, kind of. (laughs) They're both real and pretend at the same time. (laughs) Exactly. So even though this is the first time that two LGBTQ superheroes have got married, it's not the first time we've seen an LGBTQ wedding in comics. So Hulkling and Wiccan is the first time we saw two um, LGBTQ superheroes get married. The first time we saw a same-sex wedding in comics, again, we're still in Marvel here, and we are going back to 2012, when Northstar, a not quite so well-known Canadian superhero, got married in New York in an X-Men comic to a human called Kyle, who he met whilst he was saving his life. And they have so far been a very happy couple since 2012. And it's remarkable because it was the first time that we saw a same-sex wedding in a mainstream comic, actually in comics full stop. Also, when the fight for marriage equality um, in the US and in the UK as well was really starting to come through as well. In the UK, I believe it was 2013 when the Same-Sex Marriage Act passed. And as I said earlier, it was 2015 when equal marriage was in place across the state. So seeing something like this happen in a comic book before it became more widely spread is absolutely amazing and um, kind of says a lot about ha- the power comics have to help LGBTQ issues and other like minority issues become much more mainstream as well by introducing them to a um, wider audience who hadn't considered it before. So with Wiccan and Hulkling, it was very much a celebratory experience. There were no naysayers or anything like that. In 2012, with with Northstar, although it was largely a celebratory event, there were a couple of characters who expressed that they don't recognise this as a proper union. Those characters just had that one moment and then left to leave the happy couple to get on with exchanging their vows and living, living happily ever after. And I think the main point there is the fact that these characters could live happily ever after. We don't need the naysayers there, and as we saw in Shit's Creek, we can have a whole imagined universe without any homophobia at all, and you know what? The world is better for it. But what is interesting is if we shift, still thinking mainstream comics, if we shift from Marvel over to DC, we see something very, very different indeed. So let's start with Batwoman. So Batwoman, who uh, came into into being with the New 52, which is when DC did a, another reboot. They do these every few years now. We get to see our own proud lesbian Batwoman. And in one of the monumental issues, I say monumental because it was a big moment in comic book history, we see her propose to her longtime girlfriend, Max, which is something that, you know, we wouldn't necessarily have expected to see. Unfortunately, that woman and Mags could not live happily ever after, and we couldn't see them 
get married. And this isn't due to societal pressure. It was due to an editorial decision by DC that ran that their superheroes could not have happy endings. Yeah, let's just <laughs> for a second. I mean, side eye Lois and Clark, they have happy endings all over yeah. the place. So that happened. And kind of to make up for it, almost, we see Wonder Woman officiating a same sex wedding with two women getting married. And that was seen as a massive celebratory moment. So although we can see in the DC universe superheroes being part of the celebrations, we can't see the queer superheroes themselves actually take part and experience that joy, which is a real shame, really. Hopefully they will reverse that decision and we will see that woman living happily ever after. So thinking about that woman, I want to take us back in time just a little bit. Think about what happened in 1954 with the introduction of the Comics Code Authority. So because it was Batman and Robin that really kind of sparked everything around that, the writers had to think of a way to really work around this, oh no, how can we not present them as, as a couple? And their way of doing that was to introduce Batgirl. So to introduce someone to really kind of cut through any kind of accidental homoeroticism. So they introduced mm. Batgirl, who was Barbara Gordon. And in hindsight, and having lived through the 90s, that was particularly delicious because in 1997, we see Batgirl get introduced to the Batman movies. <laughs> and well, you're a big fan of the 90s Batman movies. Joel Schumacher, the director of Batman Robin, and just his <laughs> take on that oof and why it's so particularly delicious to talk about. <laughs> Queer gays would be putting would be putting it mildly. He, any chance he had to get any level of subtext, not subtext, he would do. From mm -hmm. the form fitting nipple bat suits to even Batgirl is quite lesbian coded, given she's like a biker when we first see her. And if anything, introducing her to the threesome makes Batman and Robin come across even gayer than they were before. The entire vibe is very queer. People hanging out basically with a very, very proper butler also bringing another queer element into it. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. So we've got that kind of coding going on there. And it's interesting, like in particular, it's in the late 90s that we can really, really see this happening. And so there we're kind of seeing the, the dark age of comics moving into the modern age in the year 2000. The year 2000, we see the Ultimate Universe being introduced, and I mentioned Ultimate Spider-Man. It's in that Ultimate Spider-Man comic that we see Miles Morales, who we might recognize from Spider-Man in Spider-Verse, who is an LGBTQ Spider-Man. And I'm mentioning all of this because I want to bring it back to the year 2000. And again, thinking about the Comics Code Authority that was introduced in the 1950s. In the year 2000, the Comics Code Authority lost a lot of its authority. It still exists to some degree nowadays. You can still see it on the cover of comic books, but it's kind of lost all of its clout. So without that piece of I'm going to say voluntary legislation in place. Comics are much freer to explore LGBTQ issues, but they were doing this the whole time. So there have been queer writers, there have been queer characters all the way through, and some characters that have been really, really, really deeply coded as LGBTQ throughout their entire run. One that particularly springs to mind with me is the blue skin shapeshifter Mystique, who is introduced in 1978 in a Ms. Marvel comic. She's not necessarily an X-Men villain, which is amazing. And we can talk about Carol Danvers being queer coded from now until like eternity, really. But Mystique is really, really fascinating. So she's a shapeshifter. So we can talk about all sorts of stuff around that. In terms of her relationship with other characters, she's a mother character to quite a few. So she's a mother character to Rogue, who we know from the films. She's a mother character to Nightcrawler, who is also blue-skinned and teleport. She's also a mother character to what's referred to as a baseline human, so someone who doesn't have any powers at all. Graydon Creed, who in the comics is a villain. And with Mystique's portrayal, she's not necessarily a maternal character, but... Her creator and the main person who wrote her during the um, 70s and 80s, Chris Claremont, 
He originally wrote her as being in a romantic relationship with another character called Destiny. So Destiny is a precog, she can see the future, and the interactions between them, they're very much very holding hands a lot, they are very tender, and one of the ways that they were able to portray this relationship being so physical is that Destiny was blind, and so Mystique was being very helpful. But it was also kind of written as just Gowns being pals, he says, with some inverted quotes there, just, just in case you can get my inference there. But Chris Claremont also wrote or pitched Mystique and Destiny being Nightcrawler's parents, as in biological parents, which is really fascinating to consider in the 1980s, that kind of storyline happening. Marvel said, no, no, that's too far. Thank you. So he pared it down just a little bit. But there's something about our blue skinned characters kind of going on there. Myla, can you tell us a little bit about Beast, for example? So for me, like one of my first like trans heroes was, well, Mystique and Beast in some way, because they were able to, well, Beast had this longing to change back into something else or go back to the way that he was. And for me, like that transition from being a beast to a human in some way kind of like reflected my own journey through finding myself in trans. And I, I kind of watched the comics, the cartoons more than read the comics of growing up. And like Mystique was always the bad character in some way in the, in the cartoons, but her ability to shift between like male and female, for example, and like take on any persona she wanted for me is very like trans dreamy to some people, me especially, like a few friends of, were just kind of like, if only we had like, you know, replaceable body parts, you could just like pick up an arm and put it, you know, like, so Mystique and, and Beast and X-Men were two of my favourite characters. And then obviously you had Storm and stuff, who was just like crazy, just like able to control everything. And for me, like the power dynamic that you have when you have powers in X-Men specifically is when you transition into having powers. And that in itself is quite clear to me. Quite, like coded in some way that you hit puberty but you also then discover your powers at the same time it's kind of finding yourself as we all do through puberty but in this way queer coding as in discovering this extra ability that you didn't have this extra knowledge about yourself that you didn't have which a lot of people go through when they hit puberty especially if they're trans yes exactly and it's also this having to navigate this extra challenge of puberty that most people don't have to go through. It's a very, very relatable storyline. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so we talk about the the 90s quite a lot, particularly the um, introduction of the animated series and everything. Also, it's the formative decade that we grew up in. So the 90s really hits home. The 90s is also when we start to see some really, really out and proud visibility happening. So in nine, in the early 90s, in the real world, we see the, the AIDS epidemic ravage the LGBTQ community from the late 80s through to the 90s. And it's in the midst of all of this that Northstar, who we talked about earlier, when we see him getting happily married, we see him actively declare himself as gay in a landmark issue of a title called Alpha Flight, which is essentially Canadian Avengers. He outs himself really, really publicly, and Marvel didn't expect this issue to sell, and it sold out like that. Unfortunately, from there, uh, North Star was very quiet through the rest of the 90s, but it was part of his coming out story that involved an, an aid storyline during a superhero battle, he finds a, a baby abandoned in a dumpster. The baby has HIV AIDS and North Star has a, a, a heart to heart with a older Canadian superhero who's essentially Captain Canada, whose son had, had died of HIV AIDS. And they have a, a bit of a fight, a bit of a battle, and eventually they come to an understanding. But we can see real world things really impacting comic book storytelling and going back to the x-men as well those fabulously queer coded superheroes throughout the 90s there was this long running storyline involving a virus that particularly affected mutants rather than humans so again we can see this visibility really starting to happen the 90s is also where we really saw indie comics taking off which is a whole thing we can talk about in 1991, we also see the first openly trans superhero in a DC imprint. So imprints are really tricky to describe. They're like a smaller publishing house within the large one. So in a title called Doom Patrol, 
we get introduced to a character called Coagula, who can turn solids into liquids and liquids into solids. And she, um, in her first meeting, we see her in a bar and she is telling another character about how she applied to be part of the Justice League. And she says that although they liked her powers, they didn't like her. And then she goes off to single-handedly defeat the villain of the week. And from the very first moment we see her, she is out and proud and tanned, which early 90s is really, really amazing to see. And it's a shame that we haven't really seen any character quite so openly trans since then. There's been some trans-coded characters that we've already discussed, but this seems to be something that hasn't quite broken through yet. What is interesting to think about with Coagula is that um, her creator was trans themselves. So we have own voices kind of coming through. And with that, I want to talk a little bit about Grant Morrison. They have recently come out as non-binary, which is amazing to think about. In comic book terms, Grant Morrison is, oh, they are like Peter Jackson, Chris Nolan, like the big names in comics. And they have done absolutely incredible storylines for all of the major, major comic book houses. Grant Morrison actually wrote Doom Patrol and inspired the writer who created Coagula to get into comic book writing. Grant Morrison has come out as non-binary, and even in the, the few weeks this happened, it's led to people really re-examining their, their oof, uh, their, their background work. I think the first time I came across a Grant Morrison would have been his run on New X-Men, and it's when they introduced Cassandra Nova, who was Professor Xavier's twin sister and Cassandra was very much presented as a double of Xavier so um, some people have really kind of read into that. There is a quote that I would just kind of like to consider. So Morrison has been interviewed a lot and they have said that terms like genderqueer and non-binary only came into vogue in the mid-90s. So kids like me had very limited ways of describing our attraction drag and sexual ambiguity. Nowadays, there's a whole new vocabulary allowing kids to figure out exactly where they sit on the color wheel of gender and sexuality. So Grant, writing back in the 90s, had a limited way of expressing themselves that nowadays we have more vocabulary and we can talk about these things using all sorts of nuance, which is fantastic. So I think that kind of expansion of language has allowed a wider range of characters to be to be written, to be imagined, because we've got the words to describe them. But that's not to say that writers weren't thinking about things like this back in the, in the 70s and the 80s. For example, we had Chris Claremont, who um, wrote a lot of Mystique, and he also um, wrote and introduced the world to Kitty Pride, Shadow Cat who is a particular favourite of the LGBTQ community. If you're familiar with the X-Men comics, you might think that she is um, most well-known for her relationship with Colossus, which is problematic in itself. But she was written to, to be bisexual throughout her run. And it's only something that popped up with Chris Claremont writing and he wrote her consistently through the uh, through the 80s and the 90s and her the love of her life wasn't supposed to be Colossus but perceived to be Colossus it was perceived to be Rachel Summers who is the the daughter of Jean and Scott from the future because timelines are wonky when it comes Mm. to comics and looking back you can really see the story beats that paint them as a couple. You can even see Kitty having almost a similar kind of relationship with Colossus's younger sister as well. Those story beats, those plot beats are there, but they're never really fully explored because various editorial decisions meant that those weren't allowed to be explored or that other writers hadn't quite picked up on the nuance. But I think it's interesting that we've got, from the 90s in particular, we've got own voices coming through. But before that, there were people who were championing these voices and these stories, but having to do it in a really coded way even when they're writing some characters who really should be a little bit more lgbtq so for example hercules the character from mm-hmm. Greek mythology has pit- popped up in pretty much every comic hero pantheon because if you need a strong man you go with hercules and in Greek mythology hercules had male lovers he had female lovers and none of that is ever mentioned so it's weird that even though these characters are there and they exist those stories aren't necessarily brought through. 
on the flip side, sometimes there are characters that we meet in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and it's only in the last few years that we realise, ah, oh, there's an LGBTQ storyline going on there. For example, Iceman. Mm. Iceman is one of the founding members of the X-Men, so we were introduced to him in the 1960s, but only um, in 2019, 2020, he's really kind of come into his own as an LGBTQ figure. When his coming out storyline was written in the comics, it didn't go down particularly well because it all revolved around younger Bobby coming to the future and psychic Jean Grey telling him, hey, you're gay. And he's like, what? What? And it wasn't handled particularly well, but he was being thought of as a queer coded character much earlier than that. Robert, you're our mm. fan file. Do you want to talk, talk to us about X-Men 2? Uh, sure. Uh, that is the one that has the classic scene where Bobby basically comes out to his parents. He's coming out as a mutant, but every single bit of dialogue could just be completely swapped to gay, and it would have been the same scene, effectively. To the parents' reactions of, are you, you know, um, can't remember the exact line, basically, are you, have you tried not being a mutant? Which is also similar to Joyce and on Buffy, but yeah. <laughs> so, so far we have talked about gay male superheroes. We have talked briefly about lesbian superheroes. They do exist. That woman is a key member of the um, DC Pantheon, and she's got a TV show as well. We've talked briefly about some trans superheroes, about Coagula and Mystique Beast and their coding as well. We haven't quite discussed any kind of bi superheroes yet. We've talked about the bi erasure of Kitty Pride, but there are some other bias superheroes that we can consider as well. Robert, can you tell us a little bit more about Constantine, please? Uh, John Constantine is a British occult guy. He's known for his trench coat, looking very broody. He is basically a dark magician who in the past, his magic led to a little girl being dragged to hell, and he is still atoning for that. So there's always darkness surrounding him. He also happens to be bi, which I believe in the comics was actually introduced quite casually. And while every now and then they will mention that he's had a boyfriend, isn't focused on so much. I think the average comic, you probably might not even realize he's bi. Whereas in later adaptations, the live action ones and the recent cartoons, it's much more clear. He's constantly flirting with everybody he comes across. In one of the cartoons, you learn he actually used to date King Shark, who is a shark. And in uh, Legends of Tomorrow, he has had a long-term uh, relationship with a man, which was the center of a huge arc and culminated in a gay kiss that literally saved the world. Wow, it's really powerful that we see a gay kiss saving the world. Incredible stuff. So yeah, as you as you said, his um, kind of coming out in the comics was very, very, very casual. So back in 1992, I think when he was introduced, there was just a bit of a, a throwaway line in a paddle talking about old boyfriends and old girlfriends, and it was swiftly moved on. But yeah, I kind of want to pick up on the idea of the brooding hero in a trench coat, because that brings us really nicely onto a more recent indie comic, Bloodlust and Bonnets, which... Myla, I believe you're a particular fan of. Can you tell us a little bit about Blood, Lust and Bonnets, please? So um, Blood, Lust and Bonnets was released last year in September. And it, it's kind of like period drama meets magic and vampires. And it's just absolutely fantastic. So it kind of it's got like Lord Byron, who is a well-known poet. But just being Lord Byron, who sleeps and flirts with everything that walks and moves and tries to do the best thing, but actually just messes up everything as he goes. Um, we have Lucy, who is kind of the typical Pride and Prejudice heroine, but also just does her own thing and saves the day herself, which is really refreshing. And lastly, we have Sham, who is a non-binary character in the comic, which I absolutely love. They wander around like bounty hunting, trying to kill vampires while Lucy is trying to join the vampires. And there's this like this whole like pretending to be this sophisticated up and coming woman while also wanting adventure and love. And it's just a really lovely, fun storyline about how you can mix queer culture with queer dramas and also have a bit of magic in there as well. Fantastic. And I love the Blood, Lust and Bonnets is a little bit of a like period costume drama with adventure thrown in as well. And it's 
sad that there is that really beautiful non-binary acceptance moment. Um, so earlier in this, I think I talked about Cloud a little bit. It was introduced in the 1980s and they were uh, sometimes presented as male, sometimes presented as female. Their storyline in the comics wasn't quite so beautiful as that. Again, we're talking about a, a mainstream comic, so couldn't be handled brilliantly or as accepting as we would have liked. But what I find interesting in how this was handled is that Iceman, who we were talking about, had a bit of a crush on Cloud. And knowing what we know now about his character, we can read it in a very, very different way. But the way it was presented was that Bobby was okay to be attracted to Cloud when they presented as a woman, but got very, very uncomfortable and neurotic when it came to Cloud's more masculine personas. So knowing what we know now about Bobby's character, that moment makes a little bit more sense. But we do see a non-binary character being introduced in the 1980s, and we're seeing the progression of non-binary representation from the 1980s. And most of the comics that I read that are queer, specifically openly queer, have been in the 2010s. So we have covered quite a lot in not too long a space of time. So I think it might be time to start wrapping up. So we've talked a little bit about the origins of the of the superhero comic back in the 1930s. We've talked about the kind of self-censure of the Comics Code Authority being introduced in the 1950s. We have talked about really active queer coding from, um, from writers and how they've been able to write really, really fascinating, complex characters around editorial involvement. We've seen own voices authors really starting to come through and really, really change the game. I can't stress the importance Grant Morrison has had on comic book storytelling. And we've also seen how comic books can reflect what's going on in contemporary society and how massive moments in contemporary society are reflected in our fictional world, in those places that we turn to for escapism, for comfort, and to see good triumph over evil, even when it's much more complicated than that. So comic books are a really, really rich way of storytelling and of exploring um, issues, in particular LGBTQ issues, but lots of others besides. So before we sign off, I want to ask both of you, just very briefly, if you had to pick three LGBTQ superheroes to go into your LGBTQ Avengers lineup. It could be from an indie comic, could be from one of the mainstream ones, can be as well-known or as niche as you want. Who would you pick and why? Robert, I'm going to start with you. I would start with Wiccan because, one, he's amazing, but two, uh, given the fact that his powers kind of allow him to remake reality however he wants, although sometimes for story reasons it doesn't work, and sometimes he can do anything. I feel like that's a very useful skill to have. He can literally make anything happen. So that would be very good for a team. <laughs> um, <laughs> probably John Constantine, especially when things get hairy. He is very good for the occult, scary magic that other people don't want to do. And third, I'm going to say uh, Bobby, Iceman, actually. I don't know if I have a specific reason other than I really like Bobby and ice powers are cool. <laughs> but I think that's my team. Fair enough. <laughs> Myla, who are your picks? Okay, I'm going to pick from my three favourite comics, because uh, I'm like that. So I'm going to pick Sham from Love, Lust and Bonnets, because they're just generally quite good at everything they do. We need someone like that in the game. I'm going to pick Rosie from Lumberjanes, who is an easygoing tattooed woman who enjoys woodcarving and dresses kind of like you would expect a Lumberjane to look like, and has really pointy glasses and runs around having adventures and is generally quite strong and awesome, who I have a, the biggest crush on, because of course you can have crushes on characters from comics. At least I hope so. And there's Nimona from the comic Nimona, who is a young shapeshifter who just kind of rages about trying to encourage people to do crime and have fun. <laughs> Just having a chaotic character like that in a in a group would be highly entertaining, at least. I would assume that her and um, Sham wouldn't get along that well. It would be even funnier just to watch that kind of crossover interaction. Yeah, a little bit of chaos in your story really just brings it alive, doesn't it? I think if I had to pick a couple of characters for my LGBTQ Avengers, I would probably go with um, Kitty Pride, Shadow Cat, just to let her live her best by life and to give her the freedom to do that. I would also, I'd want to put in Mystique because she's a really, really complex character. Sometimes she's an anti-hero, sometimes she's an out-and-out -out villain. 
But there's always something more going on with that character. She's like five steps ahead of everyone else. And also shapeshifters just add a certain je ne sais quoi to the team. And oh, I'm thinking now I need someone to balance out those two very, very physical power sets. So Kitty can walk through walls, Mystique can shapeshift. And I think I might chuck in Willow from Buffy. Might sound like a little bit of a cop-out, but since Buffy ended on TV, the series has continued in comic book form, and Willow has continued to flourish as the lesbian witch queen that we know. So I think I might chuck her in the mix as well, just to see how all of those characters might get on. So we are like pretty much spoiled for choice when it comes to LGBTQ characters nowadays. And seeing some of the news that's coming out, the new version of The Flash is going to be gender fluid. We are seeing an increasing amount of LGBTQ characters. And I hope that we see this trend continue. And I hope that these characters are done well and not just introduced as gimmicks or one-offs or one-shots. And I hope that their contribution to comic book storytelling is something that is really, really valued. And I hope that we really see this time period as a kind of renaissance of comics. So thank you for joining us um, today and listening to us geek out about our um, favorite LGBTQ superheroes, characters, and sitting with us and exploring the relationship the real world has to our fictional universes. So I've been Jack Shoulder. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, I am at Jack Shoulder. And with me has been Myla. Follow me on Twitter. My handle is MylaFish on Twitter. And we've also had Robert with us as well. Robert Berg. My Twitter is at RobWillB. And of course, don't forget to follow Queer Disrupt on Twitter as well. They are at Queer Disrupt. And keep an eye out for the latest podcasts and other events that Queer Disrupt are holding and hosting as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this month's Queer Disrupt podcast. For more podcasts, check out our Spotify, Spreaker and Apple Music account. We also have a YouTube account at Queer Disrupt, so please like and subscribe there. We have Twitter and Facebook, both at Queer Disrupt, so please give us a follow. And finally, our website is QueerDisrupt.com, where you can stay up to date on all of our upcoming events and see what else we have to offer. Thanks again, and catch you next time.